Hello everyone, this is Darrow, and um, I wanted to do another video on another gospel track that I had created about a year and a half ago. And this is uh, the first video I'm doing on this gospel track. I like to have hard copies of gospel tracks that I give out, but I also want a video portion of it as well, so that can be shared. And this uh, gospel track is called, Where Will You Spend Eternity? Most Important Question of Your Life. And as you can see on the front cover here, there's a stairway picture to heaven on top. And below, there's a picture of fire representing hell or the lake of fire. I hope you will watch this whole video and look at all the information in this video. And if you're not born again, meaning that you have not repented and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that you will do so after seeing the information in this video. The inside cover, the first page and the inside cover of the uh, track here, uh, at the top portion there, I state how, you know, if you die right now, uh, would you go to heaven or uh, hell for eternity? Um, on average, 150,000 people die each day in the world. And someday you and I are going to be in that number. An interesting statistic and factual statistic is 10 out of 10 people die. Meaning in this current world right now, uh, there's no one living forever physically in this current world. Uh, people die, uh, whether young or old, uh, people die, and that occurs every single day. So that's something that you must consider and think about. And many people don't think about death. They're deceived by the world thinking they're going to keep living on forever. Uh, but you must think about this. Now, here is a scripture from Psalm chapter 89, verse 48 in the Bible, which says, What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? So think about this, right? What man is that live and will not see death? So no man can keep their self alive. I don't care how much money you have. Uh, you cannot keep yourself alive. Only God is able to keep us alive, and he gives us breath to, uh, to, so that we can live. Uh, coming up in this next uh, portion of this video is a, a video clip of a secular news source talking to a doctor, a secular doctor, who describes about how they've discovered there is consciousness or awareness after you give your last breath. So pay attention to this video. It's about six minutes. We die. It's a question that humanity has wrestled with throughout history. But a new study conducted by NYU may have found some answers. Dr. Sam Parnia is the director of critical care and resuscitation research at NYU Langone School of Medicine, where he ran this study. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Parnia. Pleasure. Thank you so, for having me. What would you say, what actually happens when you're clinically dead? You know, when people die, essentially it's when the heart stops. So this has been going on for, as far as we know, millennia, if not longer. And when the heart stops, you stop breathing and your brain shuts down, and that's how we declare people dead. And that's when we give a time of death and we give them a note. And really, to be honest with you, until about 50 years ago, that was the point of death. So people become lifeless, motionless, the brain shuts down. But now through advances in medicine, we can actually bring people back to life, even after they've gone beyond that threshold of death, um, and study what happens to them. And one of the interesting things, of course, is that the brain completely shuts down, as I said. But what's fascinating is that the cells inside the body, and particularly the cells inside the brain, do not suddenly become annihilated. They go through a process of decay that can take a few hours, which is why we can actually medically bring people back to life after they have technically gone beyond that threshold of death for tens of minutes, if not hours of time afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, raises many interesting questions about what happens when we die. So tell me more about this study. How did you conduct it? And tell me about you know, how you came about reaching your findings, your conclusion. No, I'm, a, I'm an intensive care doctor. So my job is to essentially save people's lives and prevent them from dying. But unfortunately, people do die, and we try to revive them. What we have found is that over the last few decades, many millions of people have now come back. And many of them have reported, actually, anecdotally, that they've been able to see and hear things going on, even though from our perspective, they should have been dead and their brain should not be functioning at all. Mm. And so we became intrigued to study this, one, because it was fascinating, and two, because we try to revive people without brain damage and to ensure they don't have any disorders of consciousness, so not becoming like brain damaged or having a vegetative state. 
At any rate, so this particular study is the largest study ever carried out in the world. It was done at 15 medical centers across the US and in Europe. And we studied more than 2,000 people who'd gone through this cardiac arrest or process of death. And we did not expect people to have any consciousness or, or awareness. Mm -hmm. But intriguingly, up to 40% of people came back and had had a perception of being aware of what was happening to them, even though they had technically gone beyond the threshold of death. Why do you think that is? Well, there's a lot to it. Um, I should also add that among that group, 10% had a very deep, profound mystical experience that was very true to them. But interestingly, 2% actually had full awareness, could describe all the events that were going on that were validated. So of course, the question is, why does that happen? And we don't have the answers, because to our scientific model, when people have died, there should be no more conscious awareness going on. Uh, but it sounds like maybe consciousness is able to continue. And by that, I don't mean that they're awake. But that entity that makes us who we are, makes Sam who he is, makes Rina who she is, the self, the mind, seems to continue and doesn't become annihilated after a person has gone through their process of death. Were there any of the people that you studied that completely lost all consciousness? Well, that's what I was trying to explain. Yeah. Everybody loses consciousness immediately as soon as the heart stops. It's not like they're awake and watching us. Well, you mentioned that there were some people who remembered there was some sort of mystical experience that they were going right. through. Were there some people who said, nope, didn't feel anything, didn't? So some people don't have any recollections. Mm -hmm. What we don't know is whether they had experiences and forgot it afterwards, and that may be what's happening. Because of course, we forget a lot of things. And most of the people who are brought back have issues to do with their treatments. We give them sedative drugs, which wipes out their memories. So that's part of what we're studying now, is does everybody have this experience? And how long does mind and consciousness continue in some format, even though we've gone beyond the threshold of death? Do you have some sort of conclusion as to how far the mind and consciousness goes? Again, from what we can determine, which yeah. is actually uh, fascinating and it raises questions about our whole science, about what happens when we die, is that it appears that even though people have gone beyond that threshold of death and their brain has shut down, that entity that we call consciousness, the mind, the psyche, whatever you want to call it, does not seem to become annihilated. From the evidence we have, that at least tens of minutes, if not hours of time afterwards, mm -hmm. how long beyond that, we don't know at this point. Have the, for the folks who have lost consciousness and come back, have there been any long-term effects afterwards? Well, those people who have these very deep, profound, mystical experiences, often they describe a, a sensation of being very peaceful, seeing a bright, warm, welcoming light, sometimes deceased relatives. And intriguingly, some of them describe a sensation of uh, a being that they describe as being perfect and full of light and love and compassion. Those who have that experience are often very positively transformed for the rest of their lives. It's very profound, yeah. it's real to them. They become less afraid of death, they lose their fear of death completely, they engage in altruism, they're more uh, helpful to people, they engage more with family, it completely changes them. There's something very profound about this experience that they have. We often hear people say, I saw the light, some sort of light. Why do you think it is that some people see that and some people don't? Well, so there are two possibilities. One is that, as you said, only some people see it and we think that you know, it might be 10%. But the alternative is that everyone sees it but unfortunately, because of the medical treatments that they get afterwards in the intensive care unit by doctors such as myself to save their brain, um, they forget it. And one of our new studies is trying to actually decipher whether people have had it but just forgot about it. Mm. And so I think there is some evidence that more people are having it, but unfortunately they just forget it afterwards. It's a fascinating study and a fascinating look into death and those final moments as well and returning back. Dr. Sampania, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. All right. You see that uh, that video there, the secular news and the doctor talking about consciousness and awareness after death. And they spoke about some people having a light. Uh, and uh, people who have that light, once they die, it could be for those that are born again, who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because the Bible tells us that God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. And Jesus is the light of the world. So that's for them. But people who are not born again, who are unrepentance and dying their sins don't see no light they see darkness and but with these uh this doctor was talking about jesus already told us about life after we die and it's uh he explains this in luke chapter 16 uh verse 19 starting at verse 19 as you see here uh jesus says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in, uh, in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. 
And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So we see Jesus talking about a rich man and a poor man, uh, a beggar named Lazarus. And the, the time came when both of them, their day of death came. And then as we looked at Psalm 89, 48 uh, earlier, uh, what man shall live and not see death? So whether you're rich, poor, in jail, free or not, no matter what color your skin, uh, death is going to come upon uh, all of us physically. And we see here what Jesus is talking about. And this is a real life event that Jesus is talking about here in Luke chapter 16. So uh, think about this. And I'm going to keep on reading further. This is not where it ends. It's starting in verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and see if Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So the rich man dies, and he in hell lifts his eyes up, being in torments. And it says he sees Abraham afar away and Lazarus in his bosom. So this rich man got awareness after he dies. Because Jesus says that he lifts his eyes up, and he's in torment, and he sees Abraham. And Abraham's bosom was, con was considered a place of like paradise for those that were Old Testament saints before Jesus came and died and rose again from the dead. Before Jesus' resurrection, Old Testament saints went to a place called Abraham's bosom. Um, and you can see that's where Lazarus, the rich man, uh, went to Abraham's bosom where, uh, not, la la not Lazarus, Lazarus, the poor man, excuse me, the beggar went to Abraham's bosom where the rich man went to hell. And he lift his eyes up. And in verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in his flame. So again, this rich man in hell is having a conversation, calling out to Abraham. And he's saying how uh, he's tormented in his flame and he needs someone to uh, put their, 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 their finger in water to cool his tongue. Verse 25, but Abraham said, son, remember that thou in that lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted and thou art tormented. So Abraham reminds him, remember when you lived that you had the good things and Lazarus had the bad things. Now Lazarus is comforted and you are tormented. So again, Abraham is having a conversation with him back. And this is again, uh, after Abraham being dead many years, and now this rich man having a conversation with Abraham. Here's verse 26 here in Luke chapter 16. And besides all this, this is Abraham still talking, between us and you there's a great gulf fix, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, this is a, uh, uh, the rich man, then he said, I pray thee, Therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And so, here it is, Abraham is having a conversation with this rich man who's in hell, and the rich man is saying, Hey, I pray, man, send, send uh Send someone to my father's house to warn my brothers not to come to this place of torment. So now this guy, rich man, has got concern for his brothers not to come to that place of torment. And Abraham tells him, hey, look, your brothers have Moses and the prophets. They have the scriptures of Moses and the prophets. And if they're not going to believe them uh, 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 and they need to uh, believe them and hear them. And so, again, we see this awareness, this consciousness uh, after death of both here it is this uh rich man and and abraham who had been dead for many years and now this rich man dying uh recently is now having a conversation with abraham so again uh just think about this this is what jesus is explaining about the afterlife this is god telling us what the true afterlife is not from a secular point of view uh, but from what God who created us, created us and know what the afterlife is about, is telling us here in Luke chapter 16. I'm going to read these last two verses here in Luke chapter 16, verse 30. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went, up, went unto them from the dead, they will repent. 
And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So this rich man is telling Abraham that, hey, if they see me rise from the dead and basically pretty much go communicate to him about this, they will repent. But Abraham tells uh, the rich man, um, if they don't listen to the scriptures, what Moses and the prophets wrote about, they're not going to be convinced uh, someone coming from the dead to uh, uh, tell them about the afterlife. And, and that's true, right? I mean, there's people that make those statements that, oh, I'll believe in God if I just seen a miracle come down right before my eyes, whether it be fire or, uh, from heaven or something, uh, a miracle, uh, somebody raising from the dead in front of them. Some people say that they'll believe in God if they've seen a miracle right before their eyes, but that's not true because God did do miracles right before people's eyes in the Old Testament. And when God walked the earth, Jesus Christ did many miracles. And true, there were some that believed and there were some that still refused to believe because their hearts were hardened. And that's what sin will do. Sin will harden your heart, harden our hearts to where plain and simple things and even miracles of God right before our eyes, we won't believe. And God has already given us a miracle of just humanity being created. Uh, the heavens and the earth declare his glory. Uh, babies uh, growing in the womb of a woman and coming out. I mean, so many miracles all, all around in front of us of the existence of God and his majesty. And yet people still refuse to believe. Now, here's a scripture from Jesus, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, and this is what Jesus says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And Jesus is making a distinction of who you should fear. Should you fear man or should you fear God? Because man can kill your physical body and, and that's all man can do. But God can take your eternal soul and put it in hell for eternity because our, the soul part of man is eternal. Our body, uh, uh, the flesh is temporal, but the soul part of man is eternal. Now, for those of us that are born again in Jesus Christ, we will one day get a new glorified body that will be eternal. But this current present body we have is temporary. So get what Jesus is saying in this scripture here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Is what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, unto what? Everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So again, this is making a reference to hell or the lake of fire, whichever one you want to call it. But guess what? Look what Jesus is saying. It is everlasting fire. And who is it prepared for? The devil and his angels. Why God created hell and a lake of fire for the devil and fallen angels, uh, those that rebelled and followed uh, the devil, uh, those angels, hell and the lake of fire was created for them, not for humanity, but because hum for, the, for humanity that wants to reject our creator and the God that loves us, well, God says go spend eternity uh, in the lake of fire uh, with the devil and fallen angels, and it won't be no party. Here's Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, which is many, uh, as we know of as a man of sin and antichrist, and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So guess what? Many people think the devil rules hell and that the devil got control of hell, but he does not. He's going to be thrown in a lake of fire one of these days with the Antichrist or the man of sin and the false prophet and going to be tormented day and night forever, as the scriptures tells us. Jesus says in Revelation chapter one that he is the one to have the keys to hell and death, not Satan. So people who think they're going to have a party in hell with the devil and wickedness are being deceived. It's going to be total torment uh, and destruction and agony forever and ever and ever and ever. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Jesus is described as a lamb uh, in the Bible, the Lamb's book of life. 
And if your name is not written in the book of life, when you stand before God on the day of judgment, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire where we've seen the, where the devil and the, the man of sin or the Antichrist and the false prophet are. And that same lake of fire, you will be tormented day and night forever. So therefore, now is the time. Today is the salvation to get right with Jesus Christ. Because once you give your last breath, there's no second chance of getting right with God. So uh, you don't want to go to the lake of fire. Uh, it's not a big party, as some people uh, will have you to believe. And that's just a deception by the devil, uh, having people to believe that. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving. So if you're not born again, meaning that you haven't repented and believed that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, you fall into this category as unbelieving. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have that part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. So that same lake of fire we've seen in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, this is that lake of fire with burning with fire and brimstone here in Revelation 21, 8. So if you are an unbeliever, meaning that you have not repented and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that you're following him, uh, you're going to go to this lake of fire for eternity. So uh, don't just think that these are the only sins here that will send you there. Uh, just by default, we're all sinners, and that's why we need a Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 in the Bible says, And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this to judgment. What is the scripture telling us? That once we give our last breath physically, you do not get a second chance to get right with God. And that's why you need to get right with God right now, today, if you're not right with him. Because you can die at any given moment. I've seen people drop dead. There's car accidents. There's shootings. You name it. And once you give your last breath, there's no coming back to do it again and get it right with God. Remember the rich man uh, was reminded of what he did in his lifetime back in Luke chapter 16? He didn't get a chance to go back and get it uh, right a second time. And the same thing applies to you and I. And that's why Hebrews 9, 27 tells us it's appointed on us to die once, but after this to judgment. Purgatory from Catholicism is an absolute lie and it's demonic. There's no second chance to get right with God. Only now is the time. Here's Romans chapter 10, verse 13. It tells us, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise the Lord God for this. And the reason why is God is no respecter of person. He doesn't care what nation or country you come from. He don't care what's your social or financial status. He don't care the color of your skin. None of that. He's no respecter of person. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And that's God's mercy that he extends to humanity, uh, that he uh, wants to save you. Uh, and no matter what sins you've done, there's no sin too great for God that he cannot forgive. Uh, and many people like myself and others can testify of that, how greatly we've been uh, forgiven by God for the multitudes and the numerous sins that we've committed against him. And so, therefore, trust in the Lord. Is Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all, not some, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. From Adam all the way to now, all humanity has sinned against God. Now, you can't count Jesus in that because Jesus was fully God and he was fully human. And he was God come down uh, in human flesh amongst us. And he never sinned. Uh, therefore, all the rest of us, we all have sinned. Adam, Moses, Abraham, King David, uh, you just, the apostles, all of us, and that's why we need a Savior. And this is what God is telling us. God has declared that everyone has sinned against Him. So you don't get a chance to determine if you sinned against God or not. And you didn't create yourself. Therefore, God is right, and He says all of us have sinned against Him and come short of His glory, come short of His standards. So think about that. Now, Going on to the uh, second page in the inside cover of the gospel track, uh, I talk about how uh, our hearts are deceitful, you know, and that we need a change of heart and only God can change our heart. And think about this, right? Think about this. An alcoholic or drug addict cannot get help for their condition unless they admit their uh, addiction. So an alcoholic or drug addict cannot get 
help for their condition unless they admit their addiction. And so we have to admit that we are sinners and that we want to be saved. Uh, if we don't do that, then we'll never come to salvation. Uh, that's Therefore, if we are honest, we have to admit that uh, we are sinners and we need a Savior. And that Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved, only Jesus Christ. Here's Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. And it tells us about every human heart. Again, you cannot count Jesus because he was fully God and fully human. But the rest of us, this is what Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 describes our heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. And what? And desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, which is not on the screen here. God says, I am the one who knows the heart and I try your thoughts in your heart. So God knows our heart and he knows our thoughts. Therefore, we should just come clean with God and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a savior because God knows all our sins, whether they've been secret or in our head, in our heart, no matter what, he knows it all. And if you're not born again on the day of judgment, he's going to expose all of that. So think about that. Don't be prideful. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, and this is Jesus talking. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And I know a lot of modern Christianity in America has removed the word repent of telling people to get right with God. But we must repent. And that repent means we have to have a change of mind about sin and think about it from God's perspective of living right. That's what repent means. It means we got to think differently. I remember before I became born again, the sin I lived in, I thought it was the way to live and it was good. But once I became born again and I look back at the sin I did, it's so disgusting. That's having a repentant mind that you're agreeing with God when he says what is right and wrong and not with your own self. So you must repent. This is what Jesus said, or you will perish. And that mean, perish mean in the lake of fire for eternity. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 in the Bible says, For godly sorrow, work of repentance to salvation, not to re, be repented of, but the sorrow of the world, work of death. What is this saying? Godly sorrow le uh, brings repentance that leads to salvation, that you're not regretting, but the sorrow of the world, work of death, or brings death. So that godly sorrow, you know when sin is wrong, man, that leads that will lead you to salvation. But if you just say, oh, well, I'm just only sorry because I got caught, that's the sorrow of the world, which will still lead you to death. Judas Iscariot was only sorry because of his, you know, he didn't get a chance to spend his money. Uh, and he had that worldly sorrow. But if you look at the apostle Peter, when he denied Jesus three times, he wept because he had godly sorrow. And we need that godly sorrow. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 in the Bible it says, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So Paul, the apostle Paul and Silas were arrested and thrown in jail. And uh, as they were in jail, they sung songs, praise the Lord, even in that situation. And as they sung songs and still praise the Lord while they were in jail, uh, the Lord set them free. An angel of uh, the Lord set them free. Uh, from jail, that it is so terrified the, the jailer, the one who is a correctional officer that we would know, that he asked him, what must I do to be saved? And that's what he's saying here in Acts chapter 16, verse 30, right? Because many people have their way of what it is to have salvation or be saved. But the Bible definitively tells us that. And this was the Apostle Paul uh, in Silas' response in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So he asked a basic question. Don't complicate it, how we're saved. That jailer or correctional officer asked a basic question. What must I do to be saved? And they gave him the straight answer that was simple, which is here in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in your house. Meaning that that Philippian jailer or correctional officer would tell his household about uh, God's mercy 
in salvation through Jesus Christ, and they would believe on their own and be saved. Not that their salvation would be automatic because of the correctional officer, but they would believe what the correction officer say and will believe the word of God and believe in Jesus for themselves. Now, here's what the gospel is. Here is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 1. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians, says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which is good news, which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. So we better know what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So this is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. It's not a happy live American lifestyle or God's going to give me everything I desire and I still get heaven when I die. Um, not the health and wealth gospel, not the signs and wonders gospel, all this stuff. It is what is stated here in these first four scriptures uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. And notice it says that this is where you stand uh, and this is where you are saved. If you keep in memory, unless you believe in vain. And what is it? Jesus Christ shedding his blood, dying on the cross for our sins, being buried in the ground, right? Being buried just like any one of us would be buried. But guess what? The difference is he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, because the scriptures told us that that would happen and that has happened. And there's undeniable proof in the history of humanity that that event the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ took, took place. And that's why we have millions of people that are born again in Jesus Christ to this day. Here's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them which through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And this is talking about Jesus taking on flesh and blood. Like I told you, God coming down in flesh, human flesh. And he uh, went through death so that he can destroy the power of death. By him conquering the death, rising again from the dead, he conquered death. And he helped set us free from having that fear of death that the devil had dangled over us all this time. And if you ask most people in the world today, what is the number one thing that they're afraid of? Most people will tell you death. I would say, though, to the born again believer in Jesus Christ. Maybe the initial pain of how we will die, there's maybe a fear to that. But the after point of that, there should be no fear of death. We should be thinking of the fear of the unknown because the scriptures tells us multiple times what happened to us after we die. We go be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. To live is uh, Christ, to die is gain. To, to, uh, 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 to die is gain is what Paul tells us, and the, in, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us in uh, Philippians there, chapter 1. So we shouldn't have this fear, but I'll tell you, most unbelievers, those that are not born again, have a fear of death. And guess what? The devil's dangling that fear over them. Uh, but we know those of us that are children of, of God through faith in Jesus Christ, that perfect love cast out fear because fear have torment. And we know our Lord and Savior took that fear away from us that we don't have the fear of death. Here's Romans chapter five, verse eight. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't get no more plain and simple of God's love towards humanity that he demonstrated this love, and while we are sinners, he still gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. What amazing grace that is. And if that just doesn't have you to surrender your life to the Lord, to God the Father, and repent and believe in his son, Jesus Christ, there's no hope for you. And I always challenge a lot of people this why I'm out street preaching and witnessing. How many people did, did the devil ever die for any people? 
No, the devil will never die for people. All he does is just laughs when people die in their sins and go to hell. But God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins. Here's Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. So the payment of sin, there's a payment for our sin, and it's death. It's physical death, and it's the second death, which is a lake of fire that we've seen back there in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. But look at the second part of this verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is a free gift from God. And you guys know that we don't pay for gifts. People don't pay for gifts for Christmas, for their birthdays, for wedding anniversaries. Gifts are given for free. And if someone tells you to pay for a gift, then <laughs> it's not a gift. But gifts, we know, are given for free. And look what this is telling us about eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through any other means, but only through Jesus Christ. Please take that free gift while you have a chance. Here is the uh, last page of that gospel track. And uh, it's just giving more uh, information uh, that I'll touch on some more scriptures here uh, in a moment. But I'm hoping you have been following me with this, hoping that you are connecting the dots with the different pieces of information that I'm sharing with you. And again, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today is the day to get right with him. The Bible tells us that today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And I'm sure there's been many people in their life has probably heard a video like this or been given a gospel track or heard a street preacher or 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 a uh, preacher in the pulpit in church preaching and they probably laughed and mocked and whatever and that same day they died in their sin and went to hell and I don't want that to be you so if you're not born again if you not have repented and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ I cannot urge you with a sense of urgency enough to say do it right now do it after you, if you want to finish watching this whole video, you can, but even you can do it right now as you still at this part of the video watching it because I've seen people drop dead or seen a person drop dead in front of me uh, of a brain aneurysm, a healthy young person, 23 years old, dropped dead in front of me and a brain aneurysm can happen to anybody. So the next moment of breath is not promised to you. It's not promised to me. And that's why we got to be right with the Lord and know that with surety. And again, God is extending his hand with this offering of the free gift of salvation. We've seen in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, that even is going to tell you more about it. For by grace, grace is God's unmerited favor that we don't deserve. For by grace are ye saved through faith. So again, it's, it's through faith. It's not by anything else. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So it's reiterating, it's the gift of God. Verse 9, there in Ephesians chapter 2, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're saved by God's unmerited favor, his grace, but we have to have faith through faith. And that faith is in Jesus Christ because we can't save ourselves. However, it is a gift of God. And we talked about what a gift is. They're given for free, right? But it's not of our works, lest any man should boast. And there's a lot of religions out there that teach you to do good works, to be right with God. And that's false and is demonic because that will override what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And that will never happen. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So that confession with your mouth, man, the Lord Jesus, and it's a heart. It's not lip service because many people say with their mouth that they believe in God and believe in Jesus. And they say Jesus is their as their Lord and Savior, but the heart really don't say that. The heart, the mouth and the heart and the mind all got to make that connection. You got to believe in your heart that what God raised him from the dead. You have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you don't, then there's no salvation. The Bible says that Jesus was raised from the dead for our justification, for our righteousness. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is very important and you have to believe in that in order to have salvation. 
Here's 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We know that. That ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Those of us that are born again, and we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, we know we have eternal life because we believe only in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I've talked to people, even people that follow false religions, and I ask them what's going to happen to them after they die. They still are unsure. But if you are born again, believe in Jesus Christ, this scripture here says that we have surety that we have eternal life because we believe in the name of the Son of God. And there's only one Son of God, and that is Jesus Christ. So there it is again, that, that surety that we have. We're not guessing of our eternal life because we believe in Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This is the promise that those of us that are born again in Jesus Christ look forward to, right? God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. That's what the scriptures tells us in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth that dwells none but righteousness. And in that new heavens and that new earth, there will be no more tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, because all that will be passed away. That's the promise that God has for us that love him and love Jesus Christ. These are the promise that he has for us for eternity. So you, you've seen the scriptures on hell in the lake of fire. Here's a scripture on what it's going to be like with eternity with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're coming to the end of this video. And I'm not one to say, go to an altar, get on your knees and say a prayer, and then you're saved. A prayer doesn't save you. You have to have repentance, like I showed you, Luke chapter 13, verse 3, that Jesus said, you have to have repentance and you have to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have to believe the gospel message, right? That he died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and rose again the third day. So all that you have to believe. Now, I put this up here, prayer of salvation, because there might be some people that this, what I pointed out in this video is just new information to them. And they really don't know what to do on getting right with God. And so that's why I put this up here for them, right? To say, Lord God, I know that I am a sinner. Again, you got to acknowledge that you're a sinner. I know that I have sinned greatly against you, God. I know I have done sinful things in public. I know I have done sinful things in secret that would be that I would be embarrassed if people knew about them. I know the thoughts that go through my mind sometimes are ungodly and sinful. So you have to have that recognize and that understanding that you're sinful. That second uh, paragraph, Lord God, I want to stop living a sinful life because you hate sin. Therefore, this day I choose to repent of my sinful life and believe in your son, Jesus Christ, for salvation. You got to want to stop living sinfully because God don't give us a pass. He hates sin. Therefore, your heart has got to say, I want to stop living in sin and I want to believe and follow Jesus Christ. The next uh, paragraph, Lord God, I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, shed his blood on the cross for my sins. The blood of Jesus Christ is very important for our salvation. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose again, rose from the dead, defeating death. We've seen this in the scriptures. I'm not making this up. I believe Jesus is alive, sitting at your right hand in heaven, and he is King of kings and Lord of lords. This is what the scriptures tells us. Lord God, thank you for your amazing love towards me. And that is amazing. We've seen Romans chapter 5, verse 8 earlier. That you would give your only son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins when I don't deserve your love, kindness, and grace. See, that's what we got to have a heart of gratitude and thankfulness. When you know what Jesus Christ did for your sinful, wicked life on that cross and what he went through, that will change everything, how you see sin and how you want to live for God in righteousness, falling after Christ, reading God's word, being in prayer, fellowshipping with uh, believers in Jesus Christ that are serious about living for Jesus Christ so that you can grow in Christ. So I hope this video will lead somebody to Christ. Hope it would be a good uh, tool for others to share with loved ones so that they can repent and believe in our Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. God bless you.